here to help you with breeze planting seeds and teaching skills teachers turn schoolyards to trees Hello and welcome to School Gardens with Ease podcast. My name is Leila Mireskandari and I'm your host and this is episode number seven. In this episode, we will continue what we started in episode six. We already discussed how outdoor school gardens and indoor expensive equipment gardens are overrated and how inaccessible they are to most teachers. We also spoke about how underrated classroom gardens are, and I promised that I'll tell you all about the amazing classroom gardens that you could have in this episode. Now, most elementary and middle school teachers who want an educational garden don't have the capacity or the means to grow school gardens. Some don't have the space. Some don't have the budget to build an outdoor school garden. Some don't have the capacity to organize and you know manage summer maintenance, etc. So because the school gardens are overrated and classroom gardens are so underrated that most even don't even have the idea that that's a possibility, those teachers forget all about their dreams of growing an educational garden, connecting their students to good food and nature, and empowering them with the invaluable life skill of growing their own food. They don't even let themselves to dream about that because they assume it's impossible for them. If you know one of those teachers, send them to this podcast episode. Maybe it helps them to start dreaming again. Even if you have a garden space and the capacity to deal with it, I'd still encourage you to listen up because I bet what I'm about to tell you in this episode sparks some ideas to make your life easier and your gardens even better. I am talking about an annual vegetable food producing garden that's placed in your classroom or somewhere else inside your school's building. Mind you, this would be an educational garden that produces some food that you and your students could harvest and enjoy, but mostly strong seedlings to take home to plant in their gardens, donate to community gardens, sell in a mini market to fundraise, etc. Imagine teaching your curriculum of math, science, language, health, community, arts, and all of that while your students grow seedlings, take care of them, harvest and enjoy some of the food, then put their entrepreneurial hats on to market their seedlings, price it, promote it, sell it, and then learn how to handle money. Dream about what that money can do with them and their community and their school. You know, gift some of their seedlings and donate some and go home for summer empowered and encouraged so that they can tell their families that they not only they grew food but the families can grow food too and imagine going home to your summer vacation not worrying about no garden that needs summer maintenance don't get me wrong i love 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 outdoor school gardens as i mentioned before i have developed a system to grow them i have programs that help you grow them with ease And I teach you how to have a smooth summer and, you know, come back to a flourishing garden in fall in those programs. So I love school gardens, don't get me wrong. But there is no debating that outdoor school gardens have aspects to them to consider, to manage, arrange for, and even worry about, you know, that an indoor school uh, classroom garden does not. Let me ease your mind about one thing that I know you probably are thinking about that you think you need for a vegetable indoor garden, and that is grow lights. Even though I've seen schools that had no choice but getting grow lights for their indoor gardens, 99% of schools absolutely do not need grow lights. Grow lights are also extremely overrated, in my opinion. I've had many types myself because I used to live in a house uh, with no enough sunlight. I have worked with many types of grow lights and I've also grown under natural sunlight. So believe me when I say natural sunlight is by far superior to any grow light you can find. Now, the grow light fans of the world are going to 
come at me saying maybe I didn't have their very latest and greatest version of grow lights. Yes, maybe you're right. But why spend money on equipment that you absolutely don't need? is what I want to ask teachers. So unless you are in a school that has absolutely no sunlight shining inside any accessible space whatsoever, you don't need grow lights. And here's the main reason for that. The educational classroom garden I'm talking about is to grow some short maturing food to harvest and enjoy, such as leaf lettuce, arugula, mustard greens, um, you know, microgreens, etc but mainly fruits and vegetable seedlings that are meant to be later planted into outdoor gardens by whoever buys them in your fundraiser or gets them as donation or gift, etc. You're not going to be growing tomato plants to full maturity in your classroom with tomatoes hanging off of the vines and your zucchini plants that you grow, they won't produce food, fruit in your classroom. The sunlight you need to grow healthy and strong seedlings is only four to five hours of direct sunlight. And if you can find a south-facing, west-facing, or east-facing window that's not blocked by awnings, tall buildings, or tall trees, you can, you're good to go. You need absolutely no grow lights for this. Now, you might be thinking, but I want to grow my plants to full maturity. Now, let me remind you, such classroom garden has served its purpose by the end of the school year, which is teaching your students all those amazing things that it taught them. And if you'd like to continue that education with the new students that you're getting next fall using the same plants that you grew this year, then you need an outdoor garden that has six to eight hours of sunlight. But you can always start a new classroom garden with new students next year. If you're not excited about it yet, let me also remind you that a classroom garden needs only you and your students. No need for volunteers, parents, other teachers, caretaking and custodial staff. No one. All under your control. Think about how peaceful that will be in comparison to, you know, outdoor gardens that needs approvals from everybody. Everybody has their ideas and opinions and expectations about them. And everyone wants to have a piece of it, and they all want to tell you how you're supposed to be teaching in that garden. Did I mention no summer maintenance? Did I mention easily connecting it to your curriculum? Did I mention you probably have to start an outdoor garden indoors anyway? I don't believe I did. So let's talk about this last one. Teaching kids how to grow food and where food comes from can't be done skipping the concepts of seeds, germination, and seedlings. Starting all seeds outdoors in the garden is not possible or feasible for two reasons. One, if you live in a cooler climate, your garden season is short, and to grow many, many of those fruits and vegetables, you've got to start seedlings indoors. Or you'll have to go and buy those seedlings and stick them in the ground later in the season. Seedlings are expensive. The organic ones are hard to find. And your students completely missed out on the learning about seeds, germination, and seedling care. Number two, even though some vegetables have to be sown in the garden directly, such as radishes and carrots and beets, most fruits and vegetables are better to be started indoors to, you know, to the seedling stage so that they get big and strong before you plant them in the garden. For these two reasons, even if you have an outdoor garden, you better start indoors with growing seedlings. Also, one of the main ideas growing a garden should teach the next generation, in my opinion, is the idea that they could easily grow an abundance of food. I want my students to go home impressed by the abundance they created and to tell their families that growing food is easy and rewarding. That's why in my programs and in what I teach teachers, I encourage them, I encourage you to grow plenty. And when you grow plenty, unless your school garden is huge, you will end up having tons of leftover seedlings to sell, to give away, to send home, to, you know, even after you plant all of your garden outside. So learning how to grow classroom gardens is really recommended, even for those of you who do have an outdoor space and the capacity to manage it. Coming full circle back to the idea that classroom gardens are so underrated. They are amazing teaching tools. 
So other than a sunny window, you and your students, what else do you need to grow a successful classroom garden? You need good quality seeds, good quality potting soil, party cups, push pins, square bins, and water. Also, a table to put your seedlings in front of that sunny window that I was just talking about. You'll need also your gardening zones planting schedule. You can Google that or you can go to my favorite website called growveg.com. That's G-R-O-W-V-E-G.com and get your planting schedule for your selected seeds. I get no kickbacks off of this recommendation. I am just a very happy user of their website. And I believe they have a seven-day trial um, that you can use their their, um, tools for free, at least at the time of recording this podcast. Now, the supplies and material that I just mentioned are for the sub irrigated method of growing seedlings that I used before COVID in my programs and now teachers in my programs use in their classrooms. I'll link that guide because I have a guide on it for you in the show notes. Go grab it. You do not want to grow seedlings any other way. Trust me. You also need a list of the right seeds that are suitable for schools. I'll link that one also in the show notes. But what you really need that almost everyone forgets, and in my opinion, is the most important thing you need, no matter if you're growing a classroom garden or a school garden, is curriculum-connected lesson plans that grow your garden into existence for you while helping you teach your curriculum. And that's another thing I just love about classroom gardens and at least the idea of starting with a classroom garden because classroom gardens are easier and they don't take up your time, energy, and brain power for approvals, managing volunteers, arranging for summer maintenance, fundraising for a huge budget, etc., etc. They, they free you up to focus on the most important aspect of your garden, the education, the lesson plans, the curriculum, the most important aspect of an educational garden that's always lost in the hustle and bustle of an outdoor school garden, the education. Now, my Oasis suite of programs come with done-for-you cohesive lesson plans for teachers and student-facing educational materials such as posters and workbooks for students. And of course, I encourage you to go and check those links out to my programs that I put in the show notes for you. But even if you want to join my programs next year, I still recommend you to start with a classroom garden and work your way into up to a school garden only if you want to. Honestly, in my opinion, you can continue growing classroom gardens forever and ever and be completely fulfilled and satisfied that you are leaving an amazing green legacy behind every single year. You don't need an outdoor school garden to have such an amazing impact. I hope this was helpful. Don't forget to look into those links that I put for you in the show notes. Let me know what you want to hear about in the next upcoming episodes. And I'll see you in the next one next week. You've listened to the entire episode. And for that, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And please share this episode with other teachers who might be interested in this topic. See you next week for a new episode.